Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whether you're just coming out of a Stargate into this new universe, whether or not you are a uh, uh, Venturian, is a Venturian? Uh, from Venus, we'll say. Sure. And, uh, and you're just riding the acid, uh, the acid seas in your new vessel. Uh, welcome to Ancient Mysteries Unearthed. I'm Brandon James Sim, your co-host. This is your content creator, Chris Noble, and our host for this evening and this morning and this afternoon. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's uh, always hard to keep myself contained in these intros. Yeah, it's uh, fun. I thought you were going to say we're riding the acid trip to uh, planet Earth or something like that. But well, uh, well, we could be, but uh, yeah, be. I don't know. I don't know if the the people on Venus have acid yet, but um, we'll see. You know, Nikola know. Tesla would probably know better than me. He would. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so what's going on today? I you you tantalized me with a interesting subject about uh, maybe ancient sites being more than what they seem, and uh, I'm very interested. Why don't you tell us a little bit about today? All right, all right, all right. So today we are talking about ancient sites, specifically when you look at them from a bird's eye view, they start to look at least some of them start to look like circuit boards on a computer. Why is that the case? Well, of course, we don't really know, but we're definitely going to go into that question today. Uh, I'll show you uh, an example of a very famous ancient site, Teotihuacan, that looks identical to a uh, computer circuit board when you look at it from an aerial perspective. And we'll go into what these temples or pyramids are built out of. Maybe there's some clues in there that we can look into to figure out again what the heck were these these structures used for? What was their purpose? And 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 just kind of going into these uh, kind of a deep dive into this specific theory on what these sites, at least some of these sites, used to be, uh, because the implications are pretty crazy. What if these really were some form of a computer circuit board? What the hell were they doing with it? And how did they even build that? Why would you build it on such a large level? Um, and I have some theories, so we'll, we'll definitely. Uh, jump into that so that's that's today's show everybody that's very interesting Buckle you know what up. i remember back when you know computers were the size of a suitcase and uh and i remember being uh, one of my teachers he was a computer guy we had like 17 of these in our classroom we used to play video games it was a lot of fun he was the best Sounds but he awesome. sometimes pull <laughs> apart the computer and i would look inside of it and i remember looking at the circuit boards and thinking it kind of looks like a little city you yeah. know, there was like little structures like that looks like the mall. And then it looked like there was, you know, propane tanks and some of them looked like little skyscrapers. So, you know, that that idea of maybe cities being circuit boards um, reversed, I would think about that as a child. So isn't that interesting that uh, that even as a child with that with that um, we'll call it unclouded curiosity. Yeah, that I would make those connections. So I'm very interested to hear what you have to say today. Well, let's start off with uh, a very famous site um, in Mexico, Teotihuacan. And we'll start here because this is one of the best examples we have. And, you know, it's an ancient city that really does resemble a circuit board when it's viewed from above. So from the air, Teotihuacan City is mysteriously resembles a computer circuit board with two massive processor chips, and which is uh, which in this case are represented by the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. So here's the complex here. I almost got there this time around in Mexico. Did not get there, but I will absolutely be there at some point soon in the future. It's pretty spectacular. Now this is not the the view. This is the view I'm talking about here. So on the bottom, uh, so right now for the listening audience, we're looking at um, an image of a complete perfect bird's eye view of Teotihuacan on the bottom and a computer circuit board on the top here. Very similar looking. Um, yeah, I'd say so. Right. I mean, okay, let's look at the buildings first. The buildings are almost the same uh, shape and size of some of these uh, I don't know what these are. Computer uh, experts in, that are watching this, please let me know in the comments below what you call these. I'm going to call them, uh, I don't know, <laughs> computer chips. <laughs> I really don't know what these, uh, what you're would you call it, processors? Uh, yes, you, you, your comprehension of the science world amazes me, Chris. Yeah, it's because. baffling. I, I amaze myself sometimes. But just look at look at the streets. So this would be, I don't know, a road of some kind uh, in Tiwatiwakan here at the bottom. And then you look up and you have these same sort of pathways 
on a computer circuit board, I'm going to assume that's either carrying information or energy, electricity of some kind or uh, data information. Um, and then these little dots uh, that you see at the site here that are smaller com complexes, I'm not exactly sure. This is the same thing you see on the circuit board. And um, I think it might even pop up here. So yeah, I'm going to go off of TWTWCon for a second. And this, uh, there's certain sites like the Temple of Jupiter or the um, different um, temples in Greece. I'm just going to pull up this photo here. You can't see it too well, but these pillars that you see, sometimes these temples, right, in Egypt, Greece, uh, ancient Rome, have these pillars and they have tons and tons and tons of them, sometimes to a degree that you got to wonder what was the point in building so many. Mm, I'm probably not going to see too many other ones here, but um, you would ask, here's another site actually from a bird's eye view, another ancient site, very computer. Yeah, it does. It looks actually. exactly like, a, I thought that was a computer board there. Right. So, so, so once again, you're looking at, at, at what would be here. These, these small little dots would be columns, it would be these columns that you see in all these temples throughout, you know, again, the ancient world. So I got to wonder when you look at some of these computer processing chips, um, you can sometimes, maybe not right here. Yeah, okay, in this image here, this is a computer circuit board. You see how some of these devices here, I don't know what the square thing is. Again, let me know in the comments below, guys uh, guys and gals, what you think this is. But you, can you see here how it's got almost like those same looking pillars underneath it? And I wonder with some of those structures, ancient structures that have sometimes 20, 30, 40 plus um, columns that are holding it up, pillars that are holding it up, are these this similar in nature to the things we see on a computer circuit board? What are they trying to do? Are these temples perhaps having different purpose than we think they are? We always assume it's purely um, sort of religious or spiritual in nature, and that could totally be part of it. But what else are they doing? And I'm going to go into in a second what these uh, temples and structures are built out of, and that might give us some more clues into what they were using them for. But just... Going back again to Tiba Tiba Khan here from a bird's eye view, it's identical in a lot of ways to a computer circuit board. It's um, it really begs the question of of what on earth would these things used for? So, Chris, you know, I was um, there was a post I saw online not too long ago, and it was about alchemy, and it was a great uh, it was just a a great way to look at it. You know, alchemy. Some people say it was trying to create gold. Other people say it was using metals and, and precious materials for basically making magic. And we think about alchemy if you're into fantasy or D&D, &D, you know, there's that kind of way about it. But there's also this kind of more historical obsession with alchemy. And, you know, on one side of the spectrum, we're like, well, you know, alchemy didn't work. Like you can't use precious metals to do magical things. However, this post was suggesting that, you know, your computer and your phone and the internet, this all runs on copper, crystals, gold, silver, mm. these lithium, all these precious metals are actually being used to do magic. I mean, let's be honest. I'm talking into a camera right now. What is that camera made out of? Uh, what is that phone recording it made out of? What's recording my voice? And here you are, you're absorbing this. It's an image of me, my voice. This is not really me. You're not, I'm not physically there. That's a magical thing. Really. We, we, we really downplay our technology and don't take it for granted when really it's, it's quite astonishing what we're doing with precious metals. So that was an interesting way of thinking about alchemy being able to be kind of modern day magic. And yeah. So what, what, what alchemy, what, what composition are these ancient sites made out of? Cause we know circuit boards have, you know, copper, they have gold, uh, they have silver, there's crystals in there as well. Is there any similarities there? Yeah, hundred percent, Brandon. And I want to get into that in, into two seconds, but you brought up something that I think uh, is really good to, to touch on for a second, which is, you know, what is magic um, versus advanced technology that we're not aware of? And, you know, even to this day, there are tribes uh, and small um, societies around the world that are still isolated from the rest of us. And, you know, in recent history, when let's say the U.S. military, for example, has visited some of these small island communities that are completely remote, completely cut off, have no idea about any of the things that we've got going technologically in this world. Believe it or not, they still exist. And 
when let's say the US military comes to one of these places, they've documented or um, just explorers in general, but they've documented that these people not only, of course, are completely floored at the technology of like a helicopter landing or, you know, massive boats with soldiers with incredible tactical equipment and Even GPS. Even a flashlight. I a mean- flashlight would blow their mind, right? It's a, where where's the fire? You know, I don't see a torch. There's just light coming out of this thing. Right. right? Um, all of these things, of course, a cell phone would blow their mind, blows their mind, well, right? Image of you. I mean, in maybe, real time. What if your only view of yourself was in the reflection of a calm pool of water? And then someone is able to take a photo of your loved one and show you. And you're like, that's, you know, my wife or my sister or my brother. And what is it doing? Did you capture them into this box, this right. magical box? Right. Like people used to think photography, I think, was some of the superstitions around it where it stole your soul um, because it looks like they just captured you now in a another medium somehow. And so the point of that is a lot of the time these cultures would uh, honestly would view this as magic. And, you know, in ancient times when they talk about the gods, and this is a whole other topic, and I definitely want to get to that in a different episode, but we talk about the gods, who were these gods? Were they um, super, like, were they hypothetical made up beings that just represent certain symbols and ideas and philosophies and, and, and whatnot? Or were these actual beings that were so highly advanced that once again, we have to, as a more primitive species, we have to throw it under something we don't understand. We would call it magic. Once again, we call it magic when we don't understand right. what it is. And of course, there's also a, there's, there's the practice of magic that comes from ancient Egypt. And that could be another episode where alchemy and things like that are explained and understood. And it is actually a practice. And I think in theory, it does work and there is merit to it. But it's one of those lost mysteries or lost pieces of knowledge um, that was taught in those ancient mystery schools that, you know, people like Plato and Socrates and all those people used, that's where they got their knowledge from supposedly. So, you know, it's really interesting to consider that like, what is magic? And when we can't explain something, we just, we call it something like magic. So that's the thing is we're, are we looking at technology or are we looking at something that once again, just goes far beyond our, our understanding. So Moving, moving forward to what you were saying there, uh, Brandon, with the, the question of alchemy, right? And the question of what are, these, um, what are these places made out of? What are these structures made out of that might give us a clue? Well, let's move over to um, the Pyramid of the Sun, which we were just looking at. This is actually made of, uh, it's a massive structure, by the way. I mean, what is it? 66 meters um, r- rises up, 66 meters, 216 feet. Uh, about 720 by 760 feet. That's 220 by 230 meters at its base. Um, I'll just pull up a couple of photos for you guys to see this. And Chris, to think they made that all with chicken bone and, and primitive twine. I mean, the structure alone is quite sophisticated. Like just looking at, look at this. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know okay. what? It's perfection. Is what it is. It's it's per- call it what it is. It's perfection. It, it really is. And the math involved and the alignment to the stars and then the sheer scale of it i i don't care if you're the biggest skeptic in the world or or you're right on board with um with you know far far out there theories that are just so amazing look at this it, it inspires awe it really does the, the thing i'll say about the actual stones that make this is from what i've researched here is that it's mostly made up from vol- volcanic stone Um, This is a lot different than what we'll see in Egypt, and I'm going to go to Egypt in a second. Um, But some of the volcanic stone does have um, some of them, and I don't know about Tiwetiwakan, but some of them do have electrical properties, conductive properties to them. So with the stone that makes Tiwetiwakan, the jury's out on my end as to what the um, connection could be, but it's clearly built with precision. And there's one thing that's pretty big smoking gun that I'm going to bring up in a second that is underneath the pyramid. That's really interesting. But in terms of the stones, I don't exactly know what they would do in terms of other than, well, we built with strong stones because we want a strong temple. Okay, sure. But the ancients typically would build with stones for other purposes, for energetic purposes and, and, energy producing purposes, perhaps. I don't know what the stones, these volcanic stones um, for Tiwetiwakan were made out of. And I can't remember the name of that stone. Do I have it in this article? No, I don't. Um, But anyway, what I will show you guys is this next um, article in The Guardian. And this is also just, 
you know, research liquid that's mercury. Yeah, liquid mercury found under the uh, Tiwa Tiwa Khan, found under, um, or not Tiwa Tiwa. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, at Tiwa Tiwa Khan. It's one of the well, smaller liquid mercury, pyramids. Liquid mercury, that's, you know, when we look into the Veda texts, that's what they're talking about you know, using for anti-gravity and things like that. It's a very powerful substance. Yes, I've heard a lot of um, chatter, because uh, I can't confirm any of this, but I've heard a lot of chatter that liquid mercury, when it's spun around really, 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 really quickly, can produce anti-gravitic um, properties. Yeah. I've heard, uh, I've also heard that uh, spinning it within a gyroscope, I believe, is, is the right combination to uh, disrupt the gravitational field around it. I've also heard a infinity sign as well can can make that when it shoots it in a eight or an infinity sign. Uh, well, for all of our listeners, you can look up um, anti gravity and mercury on YouTube, and people are showing that this is possible. So check it out. Um, do your own research. It's it's. I'll pretty do the cool same. Stuff. I have I haven't looked into that. So thank you, Brandon. Um, that's actually really cool. So like, check this out. So we've got liquid mercury at the end of a tunnel beneath a Mexican pyramid, a finding which could suggest the existence of a king's tomb or a ritual chamber far below one of the most ancient uh, cities of the Americas. Now, that's, of course, in my opinion, the mainstream assumption that we always I hear it every time. It's like in the UFO community when there's a supposed sighting and they say it's a, uh, a weather balloon. Uh, in archaeology, well, it's a the, grave. It's, it's, the, it's, it's always grave. it's a grave. It's a burial. It's or it's, it's a, a place leader. of worship. You know? We don't have the evidence to support what leader it is, but it's certainly a leader's tomb. And we don't know who built Tiwatiwakan. We still have no idea who built it, and we still don't know when it was really built. Of course, they give a date for it, but you know, so that's kind of like the Great Pyramid, then. Oh, hundred um, percent. Even and I would say there's even less information with Tiwatiwakan than there is for the for for the Great Pyramid. Now, I'll just read a little bit of this here. So the researcher, um, the Mexican archaeologist, Sergio Gomez, um, discovered these large quantities of liquid mercury in a chamber below the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent, the third largest pyramid of Tiwatiwakan. And so they spent at least six years slowly excavating the tunnel. And after, well, they did this in 2003, in which it had been sealed for at least 1,800 years. Um, last November, which this is an old article, so this is many, many years ago, Gomez and his team announced that they had found three chambers at the tunnel's 300-foot end, almost 60 feet below the temple. Near the entrance of the chambers, they found a trove of strange artifacts, uh, jade statues, jaguar remains, a box filled with carved shells and rubber balls. Really, really interesting. You can see the photo here of them excavating underneath inside this tunnel, which is really interesting. And I think that's, yeah, this is also a conceptual graphic of what this tube underneath here. So we're looking at for the listening audience, a, um, a ruined temple. And then what looks like this um, sort of a shaft underneath it where they would have had the uh, liquid mercury going underneath it. So the thing I'll, I'll, I'll say immediately with this one, I think that was it for this. Yeah. The thing I'll say for this with liquid mercury is obviously it's, it's a conductor, a conductor. So, you know, it can channel electricity through it quite well because it's a liquid metal. And we were just talking about potential um, effects with anti-gravity and spinning this stuff. So what would liquid mercury be doing underneath a temple like this uh, or a pyramid or whatever you want to call these things at this point, what would it be doing? Do you have any, even just speculation right now, Brandon? Cause I, couldn't tell you uh, some well, form of energy. You know what? Mercury is it's it's one of the it's a metal, right? It's a liquid metal. So it has amazing properties. Um I I wonder if it, you know, power plants always come to my mind. When I hear pyramids and power plants, I, I jive out to that idea. Um the 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 steps that that road that connects those those aren't isn't that made of a certain like crystal or a certain like um rock. That uh, that is quite conductive as well. That they they used in NASA a lot. Um, I think there was a great ancient aliens uh, episode on this as well that talked about uh, the conductive properties. So when I, when I see a shaft like that, looking at that, that that looks like mechanical structure. I mean, this looks like it yeah. has a clear point. Whether that's a vent or whether that's a, a way to um, to use it, you're not putting liquid mercury into a tomb. It, there's no point to do that. It doesn't make no. sense to me. Um, I understand that the, the tomb is a great way to explain away a lot of this, but really the more we get into it, uh, why are we seeing these shafts? It, you know, it seems more 
this seems like a spaceport more than a than a tomb to me. Well, right? Look I mean, it. looking at the complex in general, I wonder if there's any top views again we can get of that. But with Tiba Tibacon, I mean, it these structures especially are also yes they align to the Orion star right cluster Much of like course the, the other pyramids right. which you know uh, of course that's that's just a coincidence right I mean that all sure. these great pyramids are lined up the the cultures didn't have any communication with each other <laughs> says all the of professors I ever went to school with well look at these flat I mean this is Tiba Yukon is one of the most um, popular for the ancient area ancient aliens theories because you know in, in all honesty look at some of these flat tops on a lot of these structures that look like they were going to become a, a step pyramid and then just got chopped off at the maybe two thirds mark. Right. And, you know, so why is that? It's like a nice they, landing pad. It does look like a nice landing pad. Don't get me wrong. And I don't, I don't know if that's honestly what it was for, but, yeah, but you know it's what, Chris, certainly the, worth suggesting. When, when I think about this, okay, let's say that. So the ancient astronaut theory, right? I mean, it's only ancient to us humans, what if yes. you were an alien that lived, uh, a species that lived, you know, hundreds of thousands of years? This would not be ancient at all. This would be, you know, this would be like a new build, really. Yeah. And looking at these structures, if you were to on a new planet and your 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 ship, let's say your vessel was uh, habituated for life, so it was almost like your house, you would want to park it on top of a nice structure like this. You have a nice view, a nice area, and that's what <laughs> you would live at if you walk down. Yeah, I you got the steps walking you down there. And... Right. That would make sense to me. It, it Almost that's like my my imagination goes off to that. Like, oh yeah, well, honey, when we vacation on Earth and we'll have a lovely spot, uh, yes, it's, it's a timeshare in, in Teotihuacan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if that's even so, what they called it back then. We don't know who even built right. it, right? So we're giving it a name for uh, something that we don't even know what it was called. And one thing I, I with the liquid mercury under, underneath, another theory I'll put out there is: could it have been used to generate energy that would create um, teleportation devices, like a Ooh. Stargate, for example? Um, you're already warping. I mean, potentially at least warping, messing with gravity, electromagnetism. Maybe you're harnessing a ton of energy and with a ton of energy, like a black hole, for example, that's where you can, in theory, create these wormholes and these portals or these stargates. And maybe these were ancient stargate, like you walk up the stairs and then boom, on that flat surface is going to be a huge stargate. And you well, walk through cool. that, right? And then maybe like this was an ancient uh, travel stargate place where people would come. It's like an airport, right? And said it's sending you halfway across the planet or in, into the earth or off the earth entirely to another planet. And my my screenwriter brain just goes off. I'm like, why don't they ever show these ancient sites <laughs> and like totally screw with the timelines and have that? Be like, show the alien. Let's why why are there no ancient alien movies where it's just like, yes, back in the day when aliens well, roamed. But kind of. I just watched last night on um, Disney Plus the Marvel movie The Eternals, hmm. and the Eternals are literally the pantheon of gods that we hmm. have known throughout time, like the Greek gods, like Athena played by Angelina Jolie, you know, and um, oh, diff of course, of course. <laughs> she's good. Actually, I thought she was good in that. But um, yeah, like th there is like that movie. I watched it last night and it blew my freaking mind, Brandon, because it was cool. literally saying what you just said, which is it. It was a movie showing these eternal beings that were designed by these galactic beings mm -hmm. to um, to help Earth for about 5000 years until they realize, of course, why they're there. And it's a whole plot twist. But but it's a whole oh, wow. movie based on the these these gods, these it's like, gods yeah, that it's we like look through history. Sitchin's work. Um, well, really polytheism is. is, you know, when you have the, when you have polytheism, you have a, you know, plethora of gods and they're often full, flawed, which is much different from the monotheistic, like the one true God, which to me, you know, I'm one of those, you know, I'm spiritual, not religious, uh, but I am <laughs> fairly spiritual. And I, you know, when I pray, I often pray to the creator of the universe, um, which I do believe that burns inside of us all. That's kind of my belief. Um, and that's a very monotheistic way of like this, this, uh, this entity that's almost like a river flowing of energy through the world, the car, the karma, um, you know, the balance of good and evil and all that. But when we get into polytheism, it's often like, you know, and then Athena fell in love with this guy and she cheated yeah. on her husband. And then this God came and they in went and to war. Like, and then there's this your kids. And, yeah. And like, that's not really, I mean, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of Genesis would be like, no, God was slaying people left, right and center. Uh, yeah, there's some some elements of that, but it's not that it's 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 a much different. They're much more, um, 
you can interpret it as a flesh and blood being a lot yeah. easier. So now I just want to get back to that kind of chamber of mercury underneath that great pyramid. And I'm wondering just off the top of my head here. Uh, yeah. So I'm looking at this. What if they were using that mercury to disrupt gravity for the actual construction of the build site? I mean, uh. if you were to mess with gravity, so every rock was felt like a beach ball. I mean, wouldn't that make building it so much easier? Yeah, you um, you kind of be floating everything around, right? Well, and who knows with the precision? You know, check out some of our other videos. We were talking about you know monks using music essentially in chants to to elevate and disrupt gravity. Well, what if like a symphony was even you could sing it into place? Wouldn't yep. that be cool? What a, what what an interesting thought. I love it. I mean. Let's let's keep this going because there's still a little bit more to this story here of Tiba Tibacon. And um, I was kind of asking the question like, okay, liquid mercury, I am not a chemist. I am a musician. Well, I, I am a chemist. I can say that. Okay, great. Um, no, I got my I got my license from the internet too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I paid 20 bucks. I paid 20 bucks for it. I'm definitely, I'm definitely qualified to talk about this. Um, so like these are just some photos we're seeing right here of the underground, these underground tunnels that uh, had uh, mercury in them at one point. So they're quite large. Uh, you can see they're quite spacious. So there's a good amount of size um, for these things to be. Uh... So here's what I wanted to show you guys. So this down here is a ball of mercury compressed um, into a solid. Wow. And I wanted to know how did they do this? So the theory that they're putting forward here is that the Tiba Tibacons or the Tiba Tinacos um, made the liquid mercury by crushing cinnabar ore, heating it, creating vaporized mercury, and then gathering its condensation in liquid. Situated in this miniature landscape were four small green green stone statue statues looking up at one focal point on the ceiling, perhaps at the very point where the ancients believed where the various planes of the universe met. So they they knew how to create liquid mercury, which Dude, I that's like think is that, pretty complex. So they're basically <laughs> describing if you were in the woods and you didn't have the right amount of water, you put a bag over a hole, throw some you know stuff in there, let the let throw some leaf litter in there, you let the uh, condensation build. It's basically that, but they're boiling off things, collecting the vapor, and then letting that condense in a liquid. Like, I mean, that's alchemy. As well like chemistry gets I mean, its name from alchemy if it's not alchemy it's 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 very uh yeah it's very high that's high your technology you're, there you're creating something out of something else the basic principles of alchemy is to take one essence or substance and to create it into something else and alchemy right. can go into many different ways of course it could be physical like turning lead into gold or it can be metaphysical um and shifting your consciousness into a completely new vibrational state of awareness which is another form of alchemy too but um very interesting chris that they're talking about the um you know the the different planes of the universe so are they you know, as we progress in science, we start to hear about the multiverse and dimensions and that the fabric of the world is, is just, it's so much more, um, it, there's so much more layers to this onion that is reality. Way more. And when they're talking about that, I'm like, what did they know? I mean, that seems like a pretty high, that's like cutting edge theories from the ancients there. So cutting edge, very have so much to learn from these very people. Very interesting. So interesting. So so that's the mystery of Tiba Tibacon. Please let us know in the comments uh, what you guys think of this. What, like, it's really fascinating. So let's move on to the Pyramid of uh, Giza because this is where we can learn a bit more about what these stones that these buildings or structures are made of, what they might be all about and what they might be doing. So the three main stones that built the Great Pyramid, limestone, pink granite, and basalt. Okay, so let's start with basalt. Right. So this is a volcanic rock and it is low in silica. However, it still has silica, which means um, that's quartz. That's a form of crystal, which crystals contain and can store data information. And when they're pressured and moved around, can create electricity. And we're going to get into those properties in a second, uh, what that means. But just remember, so basalt is not only uh, includes low amounts of silica, but it's also very rich in iron and magnesium, both conductors, okay? Iron and magnesium, both conductors of electricity. 
Then we got limestone. Limestone is composed mainly of calcium carbonate, uh, and it's usually in a form of calcite or aragonite. Both of these, as I looked up, calcite is um, basically it's an insulator. I looked up if calcite is a conductor. It's not. It's an insulator. And the uh, aragonite material I just mentioned as well is, um, uh, is actually quite conductive of electricity. So going back to limestone in general, there's a ton of limestone in, in Egypt. And they use limestone to build a lot of things. And it's usually mixed with granite, which we'll get to in a second. So limestone could actually be being used as maybe a conductor, but also could have been used depending on the uh, amount of calcite in it. It could have been used as an insulator. And when you're creating an electronic device, you want both. You know, when, I, when you have an electric wire, it's the conductor. There's many, there's, I think, four usual like layers of it, I believe. But basically the layers are the conductive layer, and then the insulator, right? Yeah, so you like don't electrocute yourself. around your wires that are exactly. strung all around me right now as I'm in this sound. Yeah, as I'm like always kind of choking myself out with my wires here. <laughs> it's the same concept. So you've got something insulating it and you've got something conducting the electricity. So it actually makes sense if your device was supposed to do this to have conductors and insulators in the I structure. I have a question for you, Chris. The I remember the the Great Pyramid on the outside was coated with something that is basically worn away for most of it. Do you know what that that substance was that that it was adorned with on the outside that it used to say a glue in the sun? Mm, it was uh -oh, but white spot. white limestone. I want to say, and um, don't quote me on it exactly. I think it was a it was white. I know the color was absolutely mm. white, and I think it was limestone. The reason being because it was an insulator. The out the outer right. casing was was, was an insulator. Um, Doc uh, John Burke, um, uh, recently deceased, um, amazing scientist, did incredible research on well over a thousand sites around the world measuring their electronic properties with high-tech equipment. And when he was looking at the Great Pyramid of Giza, he his immediate um, theory was that this was somehow utilizing electricity because of the way that the um, the, the way it was built, it had highly conductive electrical stonework inside and then highly insulative stonework on the outside. Oh, um, man, so, so much to it. When you look at these ancient sites, it's, <laughs> you know, we, you think you're on the right path and then you start deconstructing it more <laughs> and there's more questions that come up and they're so intricate that how can this just be a tomb? If it was a tomb, wouldn't it just be a You'd think you'd want just a statue of you looking all Greeky and there with your six pack and then boom, you know, <laughs> come look at me. Not this giant conductive stone that's connected to waterways underneath it and made of all these conductive materials, uh, you know, in relation to other sites lined up with stars. It's just, man, the mystery keeps going. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where I think that at one point, at least, the ancients were so far advanced and maybe in ways that like for example we might still be very advanced today in ways that they weren't because there's so many ways to interpret and understand reality and, and manipulate reality and um they just understood and saw the universe like you were saying before brandon in a more multi-dimensional way i've heard theories that there's a a pyramid an inverse pyramid built underneath the great pyramid but it's only visible in higher dimensions and i don't know of Ooh, course i you can't that's I high can't, technology that's high technology high concept. I, I i can't confirm of course well, any of that but you it's know what, a Chris? so so let's think about it like this okay so all of our viewers and hello everyone we're so happy you're here with us today <laughs> but if society as we know it collapsed today you can't excavate the internet like what evidence of the internet would be if it wasn't in writing or reference and really, like, how would that be interpreted if you didn't have a concept of what the internet was? Such a big part of our life, right? Such a massive part of our life right now. What evidence of it would exist? What is the internet? You can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't see it. You can't smell it. So this is a huge part of our life. It connects us. Much like as if we were building structures, I could literally hop on a, on a group chat and be like, hey, how are you building your pyramid? They'd be like, oh, we're doing it like this. And I'd be like, well, I don't want to exactly copy you. I'll have it slightly different, but you can't excavate that kind of thing. So when yeah. I look at these structures and we talk about what technology they've lost, 
what high concept things were they doing that we can't understand that we're not attributing to them? Because if we lost the internet and we could see only the physical world of our world that was remaining, I think there would be different theories as to how we built our world and how we communicated. That's such a good thought. I love that. I mean, it's you're absolutely right. And it leads perfectly into the last part I wanted to talk about here, which is the granite component of these structures. And granite is extremely, extremely hard, first of all, um, very, very dense, very robust, incredible to build with if you're building with granite because it's hard, very difficult to shape. And it's rich in quartz. Okay, so why is that significant? Well, quartz is basically consists primarily of silica, silicone, silicone valley, computer chips, data, etc. So now we're looking into something that is being used, I think, in ancient times as a way of one, potentially storing data. You just mentioned what if the grid goes down this and that we don't have. Well, I think the ancients were well aware of the cycles of cataclysm that happen on this planet Earth. They were aware of um, cycles of consciousness called the Yuga cycles um, that, you know, we're only coming back into uh, knowledge and understanding of nowadays where they would look and understand thousands and thousands and thousands of years uh, in advance of when they were, they would know when the next cataclysms would come. The one that happened 12,500 years ago that ended the last ice age was predicted by the ancients. And what if they were building some of these structures knowing that they could be completely restarted as a civilization due to natural or not natural cataclysms. And they were also building them as time capsules or ways to store information. We're doing this already in um, northern parts of the planet, uh, yeah, we North Pole. Banks and information we, banks. Yeah, we've got DNA banks that we've been um, keeping kind of like a modern day Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. So that's not out of the question. We're doing it today. Why wouldn't the ancients who uh, I, you know, remember, humans have not changed for the last 250,000 years. We have been the exact same physically, mentally, not intellect, me, intellectually, <laughs> with the exception of uh, Mr. Sim there. So, <laughs> so, so you Chris, know, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about the you, you're firing on so many cylinders here. There's no way that we can say that we haven't already learned from these ancient sites. Rediscovering things has for sure happened, whether it be the math that's involved or the alignment with the structures. And there's so many questions that we still have as how they did it. It still inspires awe. So even yeah. on a skeptical view, we are still learning it is a data bank already. And I don't think, I think we've just but scratched the surface as far as how we can really comprehend it. Or if we are further ahead, that technology or that knowledge is not being shared because it's maybe too valuable. Well, I, I think you're onto something there. And a lot of people ask, you know, well, then why are we not looking into this more? Why, why, why? And the only answer that even makes sense is because there's invested interest. Um, a lot of powerful people all have throughout time looked into the very distant past for lost high technology that will give them advantage on the battlefield, for example. So well, um, think of all the, um, you know, you know, all the all the occupation of the Middle East and things. Right. The Middle East is a treasure trove of ancient, yeah. amazing sites and and lost knowledge. So it sometimes is. I wonder that, um, you know, oil is great. Don't get me wrong. We love oil. We use it all the time. It's all everything's made of plastic and it runs our cars and and all this. But sometimes I wonder, you know, the screenwriter in me is like, wow. Well, what ziggurats are down there and what 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 portals are down there that they're rediscovering? They're like, well, we got to go in there again and and dig up that temple and, and you know, well, and ancient stasis beings or something. You do hear stories about the first place that the U.S. military went to when they first invaded Afghanistan was the um, was the museum it was the main museum. And uh, in uh, one of the major cities, I can't remember which one, but one, they had like this huge uh, museum that got raided. And then they saw people, soldiers taking out artifacts from this museum. You're like, what? Why there? And then the second place they raided apparently, and I, I don't know if this, let me know in the comments. If you guys have different uh, um, versions of the story here, but I heard that then the second place that they raided or just went to in general and set up apparently like a base of some kind was one of the main ziggurats. Now, this is, is this Iraq or is this Afghanistan? 
Uh, I think it was Afghanistan. It seemed, I think it was quite close after 9 11. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Anyways, you know what? Uh, forgive us if we have some ignorance in our in our uh, in our belt. We're just humans, you know. Well, flesh bags I, walking I, around here battling. The, the, on. Yeah, and the important thing to really take away is more that there's always fishy things going on uh, right. with a lot of military around the world, and for some reason, a lot of them have interest in ancient sites. When I was in Egypt, my my uh, my guide, um, Egyptologist Mohammed Ibrahim, told us that NASA scientists were coming to Egypt to talk and ask him specifically about certain hieroglyphic. Um, interpretations that he was interpreting as anti-gravity technology and NASA scientists were coming to him and asking about the ancient Egyptians um, view on anti-gravity. So, you and, know, you know, you always hear about stuff like this too. And, and just why are ancient sites deemed as so, you know, so sacred, they're great feats, but there's more to it. It's not just a tourist thing we're not just you know people have yeah. been going to egypt as tourists since the ancient greeks um the, they have historical records of tour guides taking people down the nile you know it, it hasn't changed that much really i mean you've gone yeah. as a as a pseudo tourist uh you've been there to try and study and and expand your knowledge and understanding of the world as we know it which is uh, an admirable thing to do but you know a lot of people just want to go and be awe-inspired but every time you see that i mean everyone is inspired by these structures it's it's and it's not a tourist yeah. thing there's something deep and it's like a it's a shared um history a shared consciousness of of this you know what is that what what why does this speak to me in such a way well i think one thing to look into is epigenetic dna um you know we've we've learned recently with epigenetics that our dna can store at least up to 48 50 maybe more than 50 generations of memory in our oh, wow. dna yeah so through epigenetics like we do have um which we know now dna is a storage medium it's actually the most incredible storage medium we know of uh, microsoft has over the last couple of years um they have put an ebook onto a tiny tiny little strand of dna that microscopic yeah. could not see it and they were able to put something like several google with google is a number so several google amounts of this book basically thousands and thousands of terabytes of data on one little tiny strand of dna they actually theorized that um the whole human body full of all this dna would have enough data data storage capacity to store the whole information of the universe inside of our body i've so. i've seen talks from um from certain groups uh, that meet in davos that uh talk about uh, dna and storing and using information because it's very expensive to store dna or so, sorry store information um always a little scary when people are talking about you know um owning the rights to certain DNA that's coded yeah. and how that might be, you know, used for us and <laughs> starts to sound like something out of a, uh, out of a Jules Verne esque kind of novel all of a sudden. It's like our reality is a science fiction movie or something. Yeah. It's, you know? it's just, it's, you know, I'm sure it can be used for great things, but I'm sure yep. it can also be used for nefarious things. It's always that yin and that yang, right? Where your yeah. Brain the technology goes, is so. just the technology. It's the human consciousness behind it all. And, and I, and I think too, like there is a, like you said, there's a collective memory. I think we also know through things like the Akashic records, there is a sort of metaphysical library that stores information. This is of course a harder thing to measure scientifically, but we hear about it all throughout ancient times and modern times, people having psychic experiences, going to these Akashic records and another dimensional state and experiencing anything in any, any time they would ever want to tap into. Basically think about it as an infinite library. Um, where you can, you know, uh, tap into any information at any point of any time. Pretty incredible. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up before we end this episode is I'm going to go back to the screen share, share here. And I want to talk about piezoelectricity. So we, we, we touched on quartz. We touched on granite, uh, granite that has a lot of quartz and silica inside of it. This is on a Forbes article here. And this is just one of many, many examples. Quartz coin can hold 360 terabytes of data for billions of years. Dude, what? Yeah. No. So, <laughs> yeah. Now that the, they blow my mind. They now they do go on in the article to say Magna Carta. They say due to um geology and, and cataclysms and things like that, maybe it wouldn't last for billions of years. But in theory, without disruption, th these things could hold information for billions of years. So Coins. science. 
scientists, well, this is just one example of a quartz coin where they're using it, but it could yeah. be anything. Quartz, it's quartz is the main thing to be um, focusing on here. And so the scientists right. believe that they have built a quartz coin that can store 360 terabytes of data for billions of years, presenting the opportunity for the entire humankind history to be recorded and preserved, likely well after humans exist. I just laughed out loud, or sorry, well, uh, well after humans are extinct. I laughed at that because what we what have we been talking about this entire time? Like this could be storing cataclysms, information, storing yeah. information, cataclysms, cataclysms. Hmm. What if they wanted to have a way of storing their information? Okay. Two things. What would you, what would you want to build something in for it to last the test of time? We just, we already talked about the internet. Internet's gone. You know, we, we go extinct right. or natural disaster. Internet is gone. Forget well, it. Kind everything. That's kind of the first thing to go down. Isn't it's the it? like first thing to go down. Satellites and everything. Yeah. I mean, these yeah. are, these, these are, you need fair weather. And, I, and when I say fair weather, I mean, you know, um, as far as the overall state of the earth, we always hear about climate change and the climate disaster. Well, the earth is, has gone through periods of climate instability where it's quite hostile, where the earth yeah. is no longer a, this beautiful garden that we, that we have been used to for so long. So absolutely a, a giant structure like the pyramids would be the way to weather, you know, a, a, a period of storm they wanted to build um man-made mountains man-made mountains and what are you going to build a mountain out of <laughs> rock you know and what's some of the hardest rock that they have to build with certainly in egypt at the, at the very least is is granite that has this quartz in it and wh where do they court they they got granite all the way down a thousand kilometers south of giza in aswan so they they looked very yeah. specifically for a very sp specific type of rock and that's also just speaking to their capabilities i mean you can't yeah. move all that rock just with camels or something like you're no, using no. you're 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 at least yeah getting your problem solving skills are pretty high we're gonna have another episode on or not, we're gonna have a episode on the aswan quarry at some point um when i can get back to my hard drive and get some of my footage from egypt because there's some crazy technology there you see scoop marks into rock that's granite that you just wouldn't be able to do with conventional tools and chris you don't need your hard drive. Obelisk. you just need a coin it's what am I thinking? Hard drive. Well, why don't I just build a little <laughs> mini pyramid out of quartz that's crystal? It. And that's it. So the last thing I want to talk about. So, okay. Quartz data storage. This is a storage medium. You can put information here. The question that we're asking, please let us know what your thoughts are in the comments. Were these ancient pyramids or temples being used to store information? Perhaps. I don't know. What's piezoelectricity. Okay. So, the French physicists Jacques and Pierre Curie discovered piezoelectricity in the 1880s. I want to say they rediscovered it, of course. That's, you know, we, we're rediscovering a lot of things. So the piezoelectric effect has been exploited in many useful applications. So this is just going to give you guys an idea of where we've already used this in history. This And this, this is the technology that comes from squeezing or putting pressure and movement onto quartz crystal. Okay. So we've got... Um, what do we got here? We got a piezoelectric ink, ink jet for printing machines. We've got um, a generation of high voltage electricity that's come from piezoelectricity. It's been used as a clock generator in electronic devices, in micro balances. It's been used to drive ultrason uh, ultrasonic nozzle. It's also in ultrafine focusing of optical assemblies. It's also, which is really interesting, um, it's used in guitar pickups. So for me as a musician, I can definitely, uh, I didn't know that. I had no idea that, that, um, they were using, um, piezoelectricity in the pickups and some of the guitar amps, um, also used in electronic drums when they're playing on these electric little pads. I had no idea. I also know that they're, they're used in, on film sets when they're recording sound on film and they're trying to keep everything in time with each other. They use a, a crystal quartz piezoelectricity technology for that. Also, uh, apparently, uh, bu 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 heating, a lot of heating devices, torches, things like that, and cigarette lighters are still using piezoelectric energy. So you can create electricity energy by compressing uh, crystals, essentially. So once again, was that also being considered when we, when we backtrack and we look at basalt, okay, iron and magnesium, electrical conductive properties, limestone, more insulative properties. And then we go back to, of course, granite with 
you know, more electric properties. And of course, more specifically, crystal data, energy, electricity. What the hell were these p- things, these places, these structures yeah. being used for? Seriously. So you can't definitively say this is what they were doing. You can't definitively say that. However, if we were in a baking class, you have all the ingredients to suggest that they were using electricity and using higher technology. The ingredients are there. So to say, were they baking that cake? Uh, well, I mean, is the pyramid that the result of those technologies? I mean, it's quite high technology, I think, anyways. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility if the evidence is there to suggest that they had the right ingredients to to go that far. I don't see why they wouldn't be going that far. Personally, right. myself. I, I I think the same thing. So, I mean, for me to kind of summarize with this episode here is for myself personally, all I want to see is more investigation. I would love to see if like, could we figure out a way to somehow not just reverse engineer this, but more importantly, could we, can we figure out how to somehow stick a USB, you know, stick into these pyramids? And I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically, but something like that to download the information from these sites. And if it's in theory encoded into this course, isn't there something or some form of technology that we could at least start to work with now to maybe extract this data and this information if it exists, but I would love to try. Well, um, you know what you though, know? Chris, but the, the problem there might be is that it tells a different tale than what we're used to, right? It will tell a very right? different tale. I, I mean, can guarantee you, you it will. Yeah. This, it's just like when, I don't know if it's Spock, whoever touches your head and then you get all this knowledge and it's like overwhelming and they fall to their knees. Like and Dr. Like Strange. Yeah, because yeah. Their whole like image of the universe is different. Well, it could be like that. We might not be ready for it. Although we probably- Are we ever ready for it though? You know? I think we're ready for it. Just give it to us. Yeah, exactly. Right into our veins. Let's go. Let's go. IV, IV me up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, Chris, this has been a very compelling episode. Um, I feel like we kind of, we wished and we washed all over, but uh, those conversations kind of have to happen as well. And I had a lot of fun sitting in on this one and to our viewers, I hope you enjoyed this one too. Uh, It was a very high concept thing. And oh my goodness, how interesting is that? Uh, I love thinking about high technology in our past and perhaps uh, these ancient sites being massive structures to to project perhaps information, knowledge, power, opening up stargates, conserving our 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 advances throughout time to give to future generations in great times of of great cataclysm. These are all amazing, amazing ideas, high concept stories. They need to be written down and turned into stories, fictional, just to help us digest them. I think myself but uh I Chris, say that sounds like a job so for you uh, mr sim mr screenwriter there yeah maybe we should hit the keys uh <laughs> it, it's just interesting it's so beautiful man and thank you so much for sharing this knowledge with us and i hope hope our uh, audience comment below share any thoughts you're having we'd love there's so many concepts here you know reference the timestamp or the conversation join the conversation we'd love to have you into it thank you so much to everyone i hope you guys stay curious and stay kind chris any closing thoughts for our beautiful audience i just think we have so much to learn from the ancients and i can't wait to explore more of it and uh for those of course watching and listening you know drop us a line if you can't comment on uh, the podcast then send an email. Uh, it's always in the show notes, how to connect. And I would just love to hear, you know, more theories and what what everyone feels that uh, they think about these different subjects. And if you have links, if you have things that you can send our way that help us unfold even more of this information, it's so appreciative. Um, we have a small growing team right now on Ancient Mysteries on Earth to monitor all the comments. Uh, I can't necessarily see them all, but our team absolutely will. So we we're monitoring it. We love it. Keep them coming. We're growing and uh, we're really building a beautiful community here of of like-minded, curious people. And all I want to do with this is have a platform for us to talk about these things and just discuss and and be free to have speculation and then also try to bring it back with facts and science and all this good stuff. But but be open to to question and be open to and dream and think of all the infinite possibilities that this universe is, of course, uh, ready to offer us. 
Well, in saying that, if you want to join the community, you can support Chris in the page and uh, in the platform for 33, 33 cents a day to be uh, a part of the community of Ancient Mysteries Unearthed. Chris is also a musician. You can check him out on Spotify at Chris Noble. A lot of great, uh, lot of great music. I know he uses different frequencies and stuff that's for healing purposes, study purposes, um, obviously using his ancient knowledge uh, to influence his modern music. Yep. So guys, thank you so much for being with us. We love you keep keep us posted with your thoughts and comments join the conversation like i said and i cannot wait to be back here with you guys and you chris for our next episode thanks brandon take care everybody